Th thank you, and uh, thank you very much, Helen, for inviting me along. You certainly have saved the, the best till last. The, the cold beer at the Perth Football Club is better than anywhere. And um, I'm obliged to make jokes about the beer that's coming up and that I'm keeping you from, being the last speaker. And you could consider what's the most important thing in a mineral system, but if you're contemplating tipping alcohol into a human system, you might wonder what are the really important parameters. And you might say, well, which ad do I like best on, on TV? Or, um, or going to the bottle shop, which label do I like the best? You've got to find out what really matters about alcohol in a human system. Well, in the same way, what is it in an alteration system that really matters? What are we trying to understand? I'm stepping one step back further. We're only going to cover one of these three things. If we want to map uh, lithology, we're going to be using a different type of geochemistry. But we're focusing on alteration and we need to understand minerals. So that's why we're ending up with a simple talk that's just whole rock geochemistry, but to say that this is all about mineralogy too, and it's about integrating this with uh, spectral mineralogy and all of the, the high-end uh, technical uses, because in the game of ex pra pragmatic exploration, we're probably going to be doing a lot more of this and augmenting the, the higher-end technologies uh, where we can justify it. The third really important question that an exploration geologist could ask is what about metal signature? But like I said, we're just going to focus on, on point number two. I might just leave this part. Except for if we get this right, we can map the fluid flow and interpret the fluid flow through our whole um, mineral system. I nearly said human system, but the mineral system. And if we understand that, we can focus, we, we can work out where the uh, hydrothermal fluid flow focuses, deposits, and we are mapping a system which is much bigger than an ore body, but understand where the ore body fits into that. And another way that I like to think about a mineral system is, a mineral system is context. That's the most important thing that I think you have in a mineral system. We had these uh, pigeonholes that Ross referred to more than 10 years ago and recommended that we get past those pigeonholes. Pigeonholes were like a recipe that to make a VMS deposit you do it just like this. But the trouble is if you strayed two steps away from that, you were lost. You didn't know where you were. The mineral system focuses on a few fundamental processes that are adaptable to just about any uh, any mineral system. And I guess what I'm about with geochemistry is we can add a whole lot more context, a whole lot more understanding to your interpretation of that flexible mineral system. So we're looking at alteration geochemistry. So really that's the, the take home message in many ways that these geochemistry maps an alteration system very well but it's all about minerals. We're going to make diagrams, and if it's an alteration diagram based on geochemistry, if it doesn't have mineral nodes on it, it's not going to be nearly as helpful. And of course, those who've worked with Scott Halley are going to recognise that a lot of that uh, comes from Scott's work. But people who've been on uh, a workshop that I run say this is very different to what Scott does, and both are true. A lot of this is cribbed from Scott's work, but each person is going to, to work in their own way uh, with these problems. But what we 100% will do the same way is that when it comes to interpreting alteration, we've got to have minerals on our uh, diagrams, and that's really the only reason I could justify being here. So there's a plethora of diagrams. So the next thing is you need to understand your mineral system well enough to say, which diagram is it that I'm going to use to further my understanding, pull it apart as they like to say. If it's the wrong sort of diagram, it's not going to make much sense. So uh, not all of these diagrams are going to be usable, but if you work on enough mineral systems, you will end up finding a really good place for all of them. And we'll go through some of them. What are the elements of interest? Aluminium and, uh, is a really useful immobile element and we use that as an anchor to understand the addition and subtraction of 
mostly major elements. All right, so back to my old uh, stomping ground uh, panorama. So I can shout. I made this map in the late 90s of the Panorama BMS system. So many of you have probably seen this uh, map. This big granite, a kilometre and a half wide uh, volcanic pile. And there's VMS prospects, the two biggest deposits, Kangaroo Caves and Sulphur Springs, at the interface between that volcanic pile and overlying turbidites. This is a cross section through a complete mineral system and David Groves recognised that opportunity and said if you're going to be able to map regional alteration in a VMS system anywhere this is it and it turned out that way and so I uh, made my map and I collected 400 rock chips which was fun. You get semi-conformable alteration, chlor uh, feldspar bearing with, dominated by potassium feldspar grading down to albite, but where we've got green, we've got feldspar destruction. Where we've got orange, we've got sericite alteration. And the key to this is, is that where the zones of alteration are parallel to the volcanic stratigraphy, we've got recharge, but these corridors of chloride alteration cutting across are the interpreted as discharge zones. And it's not a bad interpretation because that's where we're finding our massive sulphide mineralisation. 20 years later, I came back to my data because I've got this really cool diagram which you've seen a few times today and it's got minerals on it. Albite, cave feldspar, muscovite, sericite and chloride. And all I did of course was just colour this blue, this dark green, light green, orange for sericite and magenta. And what we'd mapped, and uh, Ross let me have a, a PhD on the basis of three years' work, really fell out in, in less than, than half an hour. You can see the alteration system, the whole mineral system, mapped out by that geochemistry on a single relevant plot. As Forrest Gump said, that's all I've got to say about that. All right, but we can look at these things a number of other ways. Another trick in the tool kit that I didn't have 20 years ago was the centred log ratio, which I find really helpful to doing principal component analysis. Not even going into the step of principal component analysis, all I want to show you here is, on the left hand side we've got aluminium versus four important major elements, magnesium, calcium, sodium, potassium. And then the same data with the centred log ratios, I thought I had the mineral lines on there. The advantage of this is that there's a mineral line. So because it's all about minerals, that's albite. That's sericite. That's K feldspar. And on our magnesium plot, there's chloride. We can sort of see that a little bit on some of the, the raw element uh, graphs, but I think that's a real advantage of uh, centred log ratio diagrams. And if you want to come along to a workshop, the only plug I'll do, I'll explain to you why a dunite is a rock that's enriched in magnesium, iron and silica. And if you understand that, then you'll understand centred log ratios and why it's really important to get beyond closure, which is elements summing to 100%. It changes graphs like those on the left hand side to something that we can interpret mineralogically, because that's what that enrichment in a dunite shows you. There's a vector in CLR space, which is iron, magnesium, silica, with a slope of one, because that's the composition of olivine. And there are all sorts of other plots. Uh, these are useful diagrams, again taken from Scott's work, that uh, we can map vectors, chloride alteration, towards uh, the magnesium corner. But importantly, we've got the composition of chloride over here. And so too, the vector of potassium enrichment in the shallow, low temperature alteration near the sea floor. Albite alteration, that's high temperature. You might have noticed on the previous diagram, I forgot to say it was in a belt at the base of the volcanic pile. That's the epidote, high temperature leaching, and it coincides with 
sodium enrichment. These are plots from the thesis and they're not quite raw element maps. They show mass gain or mass loss. So white means no change. So we can see that the magnesium addition is clearly mapping chloride alteration and we can also see with the map of copper beautifully that really profound copper leaching and it is profound in a in a mafic to ultramafic rock you have one ppm copper it's complete leaching my point is those calculations with mclean and barrett took a lot of work we can understand the system they're worth doing they add an extra layer of understanding but for a pragmatic exploration approach I like that uh, molar ratio plot, <laughs> it's really good. <laughs> so if we wanted to just recap, how has this helped? Well, the geochemical classification has confirmed the results of the alteration mapping. The architecture of an alteration map can be interpreted as a convective hydrothermal system which maps out the whole of a mineral system. Albite alteration coincides with a zone of strong metal leaching. That's the high temperature reaction zone described in the VMS literature. So the alteration geochemistry has helped us map fluid flow in a complete mineral system. All right, we're gonna move on to another system. This is a structurally controlled copper system somewhere in the world. Um, and this is just a workflow, if you like. Um, We're going to end up classing, classifying some copper mineralisation, some zinc mineralisation and some iron metasomatism and some sodium depletion. So all the copper versus zinc, we can see, that's all we've done. Copper rich or zinc rich. And we can see the elements that that coincides with. The copper rich mineralisation is also indium rich and it's tin rich, whereas the zinc mineralisation is lead rich. So. We've got some important patterns already. Let's remove all of those because we don't want to classify samples twice. And this is showing aluminium versus iron because in this system, we've got a single uh, composition pretty well. It, they're sedimentary host rocks. And so the iron to aluminium uh, ratio, is this a PDF? Oh, I don't know. I'm not getting the animations. Doesn't matter. The greatest point density by far that I wanted to show here is down the bottom. That's all of your unaltered rock, 95% of the data. But where we're getting chloride alteration, iron enrichment, that's this part here. So all I've done is classify strong chloride alteration and moderate chloride alteration. And then lastly, we look at, um, at sodium. And we've got a, a least salted population some more sodium depletion which hasn't been captured by chloride alteration and a bit of sodium addition. So some simple classification like that. Uh, unfortunately, I, I won't actually <laughs> show that what you really want to see, which is the spatial distribution of these things. But uh, that workflow can be really effective. Once you've worked out what matters in this alteration system, it's only a few diagrams which you can use to slice and dice uh, a mineral system. In this same system there was, if you look at all of the data here in that same aluminium versus iron plot, the iron addition is mostly chloride but there's also sulphide. So what if we were interested in just isolating the chloride alteration? Well what we could do is what we've done on the left hand side is let's take away the sulphur that's required to make galena and sphalerite and that's then remove the iron and sulphur required to make chalcopyrite. You can read the rest of the steps. What we're doing is we're isolating that portion of iron owing to silicate. And once we do that, you see a, a beautiful line. And that's what we're often looking for on these XY plots, are lines. And that's a chloride line. You cannot add any more iron to that rock because it's, that's all the aluminium can accept to make iron-rich chloride. And you can see that there's six samples there, which the black dots, 
they're overrange sulfur assays. We've got a reading of 10% when actually it's a whole lot more, and that's why they're plotting where they shouldn't be. So it's very effective. The chemistry really works. Another really beautiful system, we're sort of moving away from alteration now towards mineralisation, the copper iron sulphur triangle. So we can see that this particular system is very much chalcopyrite. There's hardly any uh, iron uh, sulphide. And that same aluminium, potassium, well, in, last time at Sulphur Springs we had magnesium in the, the bottom corner. This time we've got iron. And again, it's just these vectors on these diagrams and we can interpret that in terms of the, the alteration system that we created a few slides ago on that handful of XY graphs. I do visible components, so we'll have a look at that here. With the same data, why I do this, it's not the final flourish. I do this with the data set to understand it from the very beginning. I don't know a thing about this. I want to know what elements are going with what other elements. And doing a centred log transform before you do this is very, very helpful. And there's a few other steps, but if you do it properly, this is what comes out in this particular data set. Because we've got a lot of mineralisation, mineralisation is coming out on principal component one and it's lumping together the copper and the zinc as a lead, silver, copper, bismuth, zinc, sodium. So that's where we're getting some sodium addition in some of these samples. Strontium and arsenic. Everything else is host rock. So if we have two metal associations on the same principal component, they're mu mutually exclusive. Mineralisation, not host rock. Host rock, not mineralisation. And we see the same thing on principal component two. We've got what I've interpreted as feldspar, barium, cesium, potassium, maybe a bit of feldspar and white mica. It's the not chloride altered sediment versus iron, cobalt, indium, manganese. So there's some metal going with the iron rich chloride. So again, chloride versus not chloride altered. Thallium, potassium, with some indium and tin, rubidium, cesium, there's a white mica signature on principal component three. The important thing to recognise with this is that because each of these are at 90 degrees to each other, the variation in potassium and PC3 is running with thallium, indium and tin. It's isolated that potassium variation from the potassium that's varying sympathetically with barium, uh, sodium and so on. So that's your, more your feldspar, that's your white mica. And that's what we want to do, is get away from raw element maps where all of these processes are mixed together and start isolating element associations because they are what really matter in a mineral system. I didn't get down to uh, principal, oh no, I'm not going to either. Principal component seven actually separates out the copper from the lead zinc. But just at the higher level, what we can see here, just plotting principal component one versus two. Negative PC1 scores are mineralization. Positive PC2 scores, chloride operation. All right, now we're gonna move on to Prairie Downs just to show uh, one diagram, potassium versus thallium. And the mineral line here is the sericite line. Most of the behaviour of thallium is explained here by white mica. And we don't know whether it's white mica in detrital uh, white mica or uh, hydrothermal sericite. It doesn't really matter. The point of this diagram is we want to isolate that portion of the thallium that cannot be explained by the potassium thallium relationship. Oh, Jesus. And it's these points here. So once you get above 3 ppm thallium, yes, you have an anomaly. But this point here is strongly anomalous. This point here is not anomalous at all. So down in that sub 2 ppm thallium, we need this diagram to uh, effectively map where thallium owing to sulphide is plotting. 
and from a porphyry copper system somewhere in the world. I just wanted to return to this diagram to show, um, again, mineralogy. Pyrite, chuck of pyrite, bornite. So this particular porphyry copper system is, is pyrite, chuck of pyrite dominant, not much bornite. Over here, where we don't have enough sulphur to explain the copper, we've got our oxide copper zone up at the, the top of the system. So lots of different diagrams for different purposes. Uh, some of it is really just at the deposit scale. Some of it really helps us in the further reaches of our mineral system. So um, it's all about mineralogy. So how do I do that? Collect good quality assay data, assayed by the right technique, and that's very commonly for acid ICPMS. And for God's sake, don't skimp on the element suite. You'll use them all. Beethoven could not have written his symphonies if you'd left him without half of his notes. You need them all. Select the geochemical plots that will discriminate alteration minerals that are part of your mineral system. That's, that's the recipe. You've got to be adaptive and work out what's going to pull out the key relationships in the job you're working on and map the results and integrate your findings into a mineral systems model. And that's a flexible understanding of an ore system. Now it's beer time, almost. 